we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love, says 1 John 4, 16. Now, if we understand this properly, it will revolutionise our relationship to God and others. It will help us approach God with both awe and thankfulness. And towards others, we will learn how to truly love. And it will also change the way we think about ourselves. A tall order? Well, yes, but it's simple. God is love. So let's crack on. Um, You've probably found it already, but there's a detailed outline of where we're going in your bags. Um, So if you can get that out now. Um, It's split into two parts. So we're firstly going to look at God's love within the Trinity. um, And then we'll have a break for a few minutes to kind of sit and discuss with the person you're sitting next to what we've learned. Um, There's a chocolate in your bag. So it's up to you, but I recommend that's a good time for the chockey. Um, And then after that, after our little kind of chat in the pews, we'll keep going with the second part. Um, We'll sing a song and then keep going with the second part, which is God. God's love for us. Okay, so that's where we're going. So, part one, God's love within the Trinity. So how do we find out what God's love is like? God is love can mean quite a lot of things. I googled God's love and I got a few ideas. I quote, each day I jump into an ocean of God's love and have a life transforming experience. The force field of God's love is truly beyond the powers of your mind to imagine. God is all. Your environment will disintegrate as your hearts open to align with his unconditional acceptance and love. Interesting. Well, what struck me in my Google search was the repeated idea that God isn't so much a person as more like the force in Star Wars, a kind of loving energy that makes the world a better and nicer place. So what do you say to this? Well, it seems to find out about God's love, we firstly need to know what God is like. And the place to start, as always, when we're thinking about God, is Jesus Christ, who reveals God to the world. And Jesus shows us and tells us that God is the Trinity, three persons, one being. Jesus says, believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. That's John 14, 11. Now, the Trinity is just the name given to the three persons of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who make up the one being of God. Now, every time we repeat the grace, for example, from the end of 2 Corinthians, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, we're simply talking about the Trinity. From before the beginning of time, in all eternity, Father, Son, and Spirit have existed together, three persons in one being. Just imagine them, just kind of there, forever. John 1 1 says, in the beginning was the word, I eat God the Son, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, the Trinity is unique to Christianity. No other religion in the world has one God, but three persons. So what's all this got to do with love? Well, the Trinity shows that God is personal, relational, and loving. Firstly, God is personal. Now, despite what Google says, God isn't a force field or an energy. God is three actual persons who can think and feel as persons do. And secondly, because God is three, not just one, he can be relational. He's not alone out there in eternity forever. God is three persons relating to each other, talking to each other, and most importantly for us, loving each other. Okay, tick. God is Trinity. We probably knew that already. Next point, please. But stop for a second and just think about the alternative. What if God wasn't the Trinity? What if God was just one person, such as Allah, the God of Islam? In that case, in eternity, at the heart of reality, God could not be in relationship because he is alone, just one person, which means there's no eternal love in God. 
Well, what if God wasn't a person at all, like in Buddhism, where there's just enlightenment, or pantheism, where God is nature? Well, in this case, if God isn't a person, then God can't love because only people can love. Now, imagine a universe with this kind of God. In that universe, if God isn't a person, God can't reveal and talk and share. God is just silence and mystery. What God does is unpredictable and frighteningly unknown. And in that universe, God isn't three people, so in eternity, God is alone. He cannot want what's best for another, and so we cannot say God is love. God is, in fact, selfishness, because the only one he can love is himself, ultimately. And in that universe, if God does act in a loving way, it's just from his choice, not from his being. There's nothing in his eternal character that says he must love. So there's no guarantee he'll always be loving. And the alternatives are terrifying. A God who is sometimes indifferent or a God who sometimes hates. That's a universe without a God who is the Trinity. But it's not true. Listen to Jesus. Father, you loved me before the creation of the world. John 17, 24. Don't despair because God is a trinity of three loving persons. Now, let's look at a longer passage where Jesus gives us a window into that eternal trinity and how they love each other. We're on point D on your outlines. Have a look at it. We're looking at John 5. So, here, the story so far is that Jesus is in trouble for healing somebody on the Sabbath. Let's read it. It starts, So, because Jesus was doing these things, i.e. healing a guy on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defence, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so even the son gives life to whom he's pleased to give it. So here, the first thing we learn about Trinity love is that the son loves the father through dependence, obedience, and subordination. Look at verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son, i.e. Jesus, i.e. the second person of the eternal trinity, can do nothing by himself. The Son is dependent on the Father. He can do nothing by himself. It goes on, he can only do what he sees his Father doing. And this dependence is because the Son loves the Father and so obeys him in everything. Jesus spells this out even more clearly in John 14, 31. It's on your sheets there, just below that main passage. He says, I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. So it's love, not fear, that means the Son does exactly as the Father wills. So what about the Father? Well, he demonstrates his love for the Son in a different way by lovingly showing and sharing his works. Look back up at chapter five, verse 20. Jesus goes on, for the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these. Now, the idea here is that of a craftsman and his apprentice. So the father craftsman loves his son so much that he wants to share all his skill and knowledge of the family business with the son. 
So as it says in verse 20, the father shows the son all he does. And the father shares everything, even his greatest works. And the son loves the father so much that he gratefully mirrors all that the father's showing him. And so their love means that the father and the son always do the same thing. They work in complete harmony just because they love each other so much. As Jesus says back in verse 19, whatever the father does, the son also does. Now let's stop for a moment and uh, think to get our heads around this. Now imagine you visit a famous sculptor's studio. You stand in the corner and you quietly watch. There is the sculptor and his son working away together, chipping a huge block of red marble, quietly talking as they progress. There's total peace and coordination acting as if they're one person. You see them reach a difficult bit and the, the father is showing his son what he's doing. It's clear that he loves his son so much that he's not holding anything back. There's no rivalry. He's sharing all his plans and expertise, and he's letting his son do everything that he's doing. And likewise, the son loves his dad back so much that, he's, that he does everything that his dad says, exactly as he says it. Not out of a grim duty, but from a joyful delight in pleasing his dad as they share one common goal. A shard of red stone falls near your feet and you pick it up and you're shocked to see what it is. The stone isn't marbled by some red mineral, it's, it's somehow marbled with the very blood of the sun and you realise that somehow the father gave his precious son to die in order for this sculpture to be made. Breathless, you step back and then you see that out of the difficult bit they were working on emerges a face, the most beautiful, perfect face you've ever seen. It's your face, and you realise they're sculpting you. It's the redeemed you at the end of time. This great work, this fruit of the incredible love between the father and the son, hewn from the death of that precious son, is you the perfect you. So that's a picture of the love between the father and the son. And we'll look more at how that love is turned towards us in part two. But now, all this talk of Trinity may seem a bit philosophical, a little bit pie in the sky, but can I challenge you to see that God's Trinity love has everything to do with us at the most basic level of our lives? I've got a couple of applications. The first is point two. Trinity love means that love is an ultimate reality. You see, because God is Trinity and therefore God is love, it means that at the heart of the universe is loving relationship. Before time and space and matter, there was the love of God. So love isn't an optional extra in life. It is fundamental to the fabric of the universe. It's more real than atoms and molecules, which means wonderfully and dauntingly, when we understand what true love is really like, we have to be loved and we have to love. Love is not just like some personality trait, like spontaneity. We can say, well, I'm just not into spontaneity, but we can't say, I'm just not into love, any more than we can say, well, I'm just not into atoms. As creatures made by an eternally loving, Trinitarian God, we have to love. It's what we are, and it's what our universe is about. The second application is point three. Trinity love means all true love is other-centred. Now, what we saw from John 5 and the two sculptors is a love that was fundamentally other-centred. The father loving the son and the son loving the father, each putting the other before the self. Now, this is countercultural. 
You see, our culture's understanding of love, I think, says that self-expression in love, as in everything else, is life's greatest goal. If you search for love on the internet, one of the top results that comes up is the enemy's top 29 love lyrics. And number 15 by the John Butler trio, whoever they are, sorry, music buffs, um, sums up this idea of love as self-expression. The lyric goes, so I'm thanking you today because of you, I am now me. In our culture, love is about us truly expressing ourselves. Because of you, I am now me. Love's an expression of our desires and our needs. Now, it's true that those desires can be selfless for a time, but it, it seems that once our desire or needs fade, or when our loves, loved ones begin to constrict or control us, we often say that the love has died, meaning we've stopped loving. And if we do this, it shows our love to be ultimately selfish, not other-centered. But Trinity love shows us that true love is other-centered. But how do we do it? Well, it's simple. Jesus says we copy the way he loves his father, just like how the sun sculptor loved his dad. Now, Jesus explains this, how this kind of works, more fully in John 15. So we're going to have a look at that. Um, it's on the outline, starting at verse 9. So Jesus starts off, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. So it starts with the Father's other-centered love for the Son, which we remember is showing and sharing his great works, like the Father sculptor sharing his work with his Son. And Jesus says, in the same way that the fathers loved the son, so Jesus loves us. I, it's kind of like we're like Jesus' apprentices, and he shows and shares his great work of redemption. He says, as the fathers loved me, so I have loved you. And then, here's the bit for us. In verse 9b, Jesus tells us how we are to love. He says, now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. So we love by copying the other-centered way that the son loves the father. We love by obeying, submitting to, and joining in with the son's work, just as the son sculptor obediently did all his dad told him to. Jesus goes on in verse 14. You're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. Our love is itself obedience. And it's not grim servitude, but the joy of a friend who's got the privilege of being in on the very plans that the father has shown the son. The Father's plans for the salvation of the world, you could say, are like the sketches for the most amazing Michelangelo sculpture ever. And out of love, he shares that business with the Son, and the Son shares it with us. We're a friend, not a servant. We've seen the plans, and he's not frightened to give us a chisel, as it were. And our response is to love, obey, and join in. So... Is your love other person centered for God? Do you put his plans before your own? Do you love God by actually obeying him? If you say you love God, but do not obey him, you are not loving him. And when you do obey God, do you do it still as a mere servant, out of duty, with half an eye to the loopholes and schemes to clock off early, loving him only so far as he pays you with good things? Or do you obey out of love, as a friend whom God has lovingly shared the honor of working with him? And what about other people? Is your love other person centered for them? 
Contrary to every women's magazine's advice page, true other person-centred love says, do restrict yourself, do self-deny, be dependent, constrict your own needs, really want what's best for others without concern of what's best for you. And marvellously, if you do this, you'll become more truly free, more truly yourself. Just like the sun sculptor who put aside self and always does the will of the Father. You won't shrivel up into a simpering ball of weakness. Instead, you will become the person God made you to be. A person with true love sown into their very being. And so, as the Apostle Peter says, you'll share in the divine nature the nature of the eternal persons of the Trinity. And if that doesn't blow your head off, I don't know what will. <laughs>